people started to run out of food. And that's when we realized that we had a really serious emergency on our hands. People living in poverty can't afford things like soap or hygiene or cleaning materials. So we added that into the food kits so that people could wash hands. It's felt good to try to do something, but the problem is so, so big. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to COVID-19 Heroes. I'm your host, Lorraine Schneider, and today I'm speaking with Maggie Doyne. Maggie lives in Surkat, Nepal, where she is mom to over 50 children at the Kopala Valley Children's Home. As the co-founder and CEO of the Blink Now Foundation, she also runs a school, a safe house for at-risk teenage girls, and a women's center for local women to gather and learn. In 2013, Maggie received the Forbes Award for Excellence in Education. Two years later, she was named the CNN Hero of the Year, and in 2014, she was honored by the Dalai Lama as an unsung hero of compassion. Today with us, she shares how Nepal has been afflicted by COVID, what the foundation is doing to help, and how she finds strength and resilience within her kids. Hi, Maggie. Thank you for being on today's show of COVID-19 Heroes. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Lorraine. Maggie, you are the co-founder and CEO of the Blink Now Foundation. Tell us about its origins and what drew you to Nepal and the community that you're currently serving. I actually was not planning to come here at all. My life was set on a very, very different track. I grew up in suburban New Jersey with a mom and a dad and two sisters. I went to a great public school. I don't know if you know anything about suburban New Jersey, but you're kind of um, groomed to go to college and, you know, do a very sort of cookie cutter, follow the dotted line type of uh, thing. And at the, at the very last moment, I was a senior in high school and I just thought, oh my gosh, I don't really know a lot about what I want to do who I am or what I want to be. And so it didn't really make sense to go and spend a lot of money that I didn't have on an expensive education. And I thought, why don't I travel? And so initially I signed up for a gap year, amazing culturally immersive program that took me and other students around the world. And then I ended up in 2005 in Northeastern India. And um, that's actually where I met my co-founder, Tope, who uh, we were both working together in a Nepalese refugee NGO organization. And that's when I came to know about the issues facing Nepal. And I just got really curious. We were both, Tope and I, following the news and the events. Tope, because he's from a rural region of Nepal where the civil war was hitting very, very hard. Um, And me, because I was getting to know a lot of children and hearing their stories and seeing families separated. And, you know, when you're a refugee coming across the Indian border, that's pretty much as at risk as it gets. And so this project was focused on intercepting really severe cases and trying to give families and children refuge. So long story short, uh, I ended up going to Nepal on my first trip. I fell in love with the people, with the resilience, with the beauty of this place. And there was also, you know, the raw effects of civil war and its effect on children and women. And so uh, Tope and I both kind of jointly decided we wanted to come here to Nepal and do something. And uh, we started on a dry riverbed enrolling children who were breaking rocks into school. That was kind of our initial mission because we know that education really changes children's lives. It's the one single investment you can make that can change the trajectory of an, of a person's entire future and end cycles of poverty and violence. So we started there. We have since expanded into permanent children's home and residence, a safe home for at-risk girls, our amazing green sustainable school, a women's empowerment center, family development programming, really the whole picture, nutrition, health, wellness, um, and We're based on going deep into a community sustainably and trying to change things on a local level. So that's what we do. Um, We're called the Blink Now Foundation. That's really wonderful. So how has Nepal been affected by COVID so far? Initially, you know, we're all kind of watching just like the rest of the world 
we were listening. We didn't know how scared to be, how nervous to be. And then all of a sudden, just it almost felt like overnight, the country went into complete lockdown. A couple days before the border closed, there was a mad rush. Because if you know anything about Nepal, a huge part of Nepal's economy comes from remittances and export of labor abroad. So whether that's India, Malaysia, the Middle East. So what happened was a lot of Nepali migrants working in India started to rush the border. And the Nepali government closed and sealed the border. And Nepal is also landlocked. So to the north, we have Tibet, also known as China, and the Himalayan mountains, actually, Himalayan mountains make up for most of Nepal. And then to the south, we just have the Indian border. So we had to kind of lock and seal off as a country. And, and nobody knew what the impact would be of the migrant people coming back. And what was really sad is that the Indian migrant workforce, the Nepalis working abroad in India, had nowhere to go. So there were just stories of people walking hundreds of kilometers without food and, you know, getting so desperate that they swam across the river because no one could work. And I think the biggest thing to note about this situation in countries like Nepal is that a huge part of the workforce is also daily wage laborers, meaning that, you know, maybe you cut firewoods uh, from the forest and you carry it into town or you're a vegetable seller, whatever you make in a day, two, three dollars living below the poverty line. Uh, maybe you're a construction worker, a laborer carrying rocks. You take that money at that two to three dollars, you use it to feed your family and that's really what you have to survive on. So the biggest issue is that daily wage laborers, their work just stopped. And before the pandemic, I can't imagine or fathom, I, I work with a lot of, I know daily wage workers, I've seen it, I, I feel what they're up against. I couldn't have imagined a single day of a migrant worker or a daily wage laborer going without work. And it's been two months now. So we're seeing hunger. We're seeing, you know, lack of food. Uh, we're seeing a lot of families separated. We have, uh, I think the stat right now is 400,000 Nepali laborers abroad that are just kind of stuck, whether it be in labor camps that are shut down or at the border waiting to come back. And that, you know, those remittances, which makes up for about 30% of the economy aren't coming in, which is really scary. Tourism is shut down, which is the second leading contributor to our country's GDP. Lockdown is really serious here. Like if you go outside, you just see police wandering the streets, which is a really good thing because if it were to hit, you know, we haven't seen coronavirus really hit here in massive. I think masses, I think there's like 200 cases. And if it were to hit, I mean, the hospitals are not set up to deal with mass sickness. So I feel like we're kind of holding our breath and at the same time worried about the poorest of the poor. Like in every country of the world, I think this really highlights the disparity and the inequality. The school children are not able to change to online learning. Nobody has internet. The power is out for most of the day. And schools are safe havens, you know, like for our student body, they get their school lunch at school. They, that's their safe place where they come. So the issues are so... They just go on and on. It's scary. I've been I've been really worried about it. Yeah, that it, it sounds incredibly hard. So facing those challenges, what is the Blink Now Foundation doing currently to help with a COVID response? I think the first week we were all just sitting tight. We run and operate out of, out of a children's home. You can actually, I'm sure you can hear the 50 kids outside. <laughs> and we live in this, you know, beautiful little yellow home with with. 50 something kids and we're running some other residences. But yeah, the first week we were just like sitting tight. And then by week two, there just started to be a lineup of people, mostly women and children outside of our gates. And that's when we realized we started to get calls. Our social workers and our health workers started to get calls. Um, our teachers started to get calls and people started to run out of food to eat. And that's when we realized that we had a really serious emergency on our hands. And so we just started calling up our local farming cooperative, taking stock of what kind of food they had, and just adding up as much as we could and sending rice to the mill. 
And we all as a team started to get food out into the hands of people. We started with a food bank. We started doing food drops. We had our teachers kind of move to like an emergency calling system where they could call our students if they had a phone or call neighbors and try to get in touch with students, make sure that they were okay, you know, mentally and socially, emotionally. And our social workers and counselors and health workers started to get just accurate information out to families. You know, we're battling a lot of illiteracy, misinformation when you can't really read the facts or have reliable news, it gets complicated. So that's kind of how we started is just making emergency food kits with rice and lentils and oil and salt. You know, people living in poverty, they they can't afford things like soap or hygiene or cleaning materials. So we added that into the food kits so that people could wash hands. And um, it's been, gosh, it's been two months and we've delivered over 100,000 pounds of food to about 2,000 families. The food kits um, can last a family of five, two weeks, which gets them out of kind of imminent danger. And our women's center, luckily we have over 200 women trained in weaving and sewing and different empowerment skills. So we mobilize many of them to start making masks and um, sewing hospital materials. The regional hospital started, started to order um, certain gowns and other materials. So we were lucky enough to get those orders and get our women sewing and making. And so we just, as a team, we, we mobilized right away and, and moved into action, which felt, it's felt good to try to do something. But the problem is, is so, so big. Children always have a unique perspective on the world. They are very curious, they're very observant, and they're also very resilient. What is this experience like for the 50 plus children at your children's home? It's been interesting. You know, I'm I'm a mother figure here with, with other caregivers and we'll put on our gloves and our masks and we'll go out into say flood camps or river areas where there's settlements or impoverished areas. And we're seeing, you know, hunger, desperation, fear, sadness. I mean, I've seen hundreds of women just crying, just crying. They're so scared. And then I come back and my children, you know, we live in a sort of, um, it's, it has a boundary and I come in and my children are laughing and they're singing and their, their music is still playing. And, you know, we haven't been able to get things like fruit at home or because of the border shutdown, you know, we, we haven't been able to get things like bread or butter, like some of like, you know, the fancier things, anything besides rice and beans and potatoes. And so they'll be like, what? we don't have fruit. And I kind of have had to stop myself from being like, do you understand how bad things are out there? Because I want to preserve their innocence. Like I don't, I don't want them to feel afraid. You know, they haven't left the little compound here for two months. And the older ones, you know, they know they've been reading and I'm able to talk to them. We've been listening to podcasts actually, just so that they understand what's happening. But the little ones, like the three and the four year olds, I kind of, I don't want them to know. Like, other than what they need to, of washing their hands and staying safe and understanding why there's people outside of the gate and peering in and, and you know, I, they need to understand why people are crying. I, I try to explain it in kids' terms, but we see this all over the world after 9-11 or in more torn regions that kids are playing amidst like bombs going off. The thing about children is that they are so resilient and sweet and able to be in the moment and not in fear or anxiety. So it's been interesting to like watch them during this time and see that they're, they have their little worries or concerns, but for the most part, like they're just them and they're happy and they're joyful and uh, they're just kids. <laughs> they're still themselves. They miss school. It's really sweet. We, um, We've been making this at home learning curriculum. Our educational team has been working really hard because we don't have internet. The kids can't come to school. So we run a food bank. And when our students come to pick up their food bank materials, they also take home like a little workbook with homework and things that the teachers put together, activities. 
And it's really sweet because we'll see the kids and they'll be like, when are we getting our next homework? I'm so excited. Like they really miss school. I think they miss their friends um, and they miss school. It's nice to see them asking for homework. It's definitely the first time I've ever heard them asking for homework. <laughs> That's great. That's great. And I, I think it's nice that they in return give you positive energy by just seeing how resilient they are and how they're still being kids and and enjoying the the simple things in life. They're keeping me going. Like otherwise it would just be so depressing and dark. Like it's a gift really for me because and for all of us, like Saksham who's out there every day. You know, it's hard. It's really hard emotionally and psychologically to see the pain and the suffering and then to come back to this yellow house with kids riding bicycles and music blaring and see people's generosity and care. It's like, it's really good to have that balance, I have to say, psychologically. On the other spectrum of that, during this time, we're also seeing a rise in intimate partner violence. Uh, How is Blink now helping to serve as a refuge for at-risk women and teenagers in your area? Yeah, so we're, we're continuing to run a safe home And at our food bank, actually, we also have this amazing attorney, lawyer, women's rights activist named Gita, Gita Koirala. And so we've kept her as a resource for women to talk to. And then our own women's center also has our team calling the women and just checking in. We have definitely, like you said, seen an uptick in domestic violence. I was talking to one of our young women yesterday who had fled her home and just left and and was staying with a neighbor. So um, we're just trying to get food. You know, our, our women come to the food bank, our women's center graduates. You know, one of the things that we give in our empowerment and training course is knowing their rights in, you know, making their own documentation, like a citizenship card, having their own bank account. And we're seeing that now, like how important that is, right? During a time when, you know, they might not be able to get out or leave a bad situation. So we're just staying on the phone, staying in contact, making sure that they're in touch with each other to provide support, because that's another beautiful thing about bringing the Women's Center women together. Now they have each other to kind of take care of and look after each other. And yeah, so just calling, checking in, keeping them busy, like having purpose and meaning and all of this, like making the masks and keeping them earning a living. And um, I want them to make little bags for all the food kits because we've been using plastic actually to put like the salt and the oil and the soap in. So yesterday we were thinking like, oh my gosh, we should, Rosna, our Women's Center director and I were like, oh, we could just have them make like really cheap reusable bags and then we wouldn't have to be using plastic. So just again, getting them income generation and, and support and council. But yeah, domestic violence is real. And we're seeing it now more than ever. You are from New Jersey, one of the most severely hit states in the US. Um, How is it for you personally being so far away from your family and friends back in the States during such difficult times? And and I know that your husband and your daughter are also currently in, in Canada, adding this to that as well. Yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah, my um, so my husband and I have we have a biological daughter, and uh, a few weeks ago there was an evacuation flight from the Commonwealth, and my husband's Canadian. I'm they were both eligible to get on the flight in a matter of seconds. We had to kind of make the decision, and and they flew, they flew back to quarantine and be closer to my uh, in laws. And my mom is in New Jersey and she's alone. And uh, I've been, I've been talking to her. Actually, I talked to her on Sunday because it's Mother's Day. And, um, you know, my mom's a realtor. So we're worried about her job and her work. And interestingly enough, she was originally a nurse. So she kind of knows what this means for just like the medical side of things. So I've been talking to her a lot about that. And she just looked at me through FaceTime and said, Maggie, like someone's dying every 43 seconds and I can't complain about the real estate or not being able to work or the market dissolving. Like I just want to stay safe and I keep sending her books and podcasts and we're trying to, you know, it's like, okay, have you read this book, mom? Like, I just want her to stay, you know, um, she's really, she's a really strong person. 
but yeah, we're, we're all scared about our parents, right? We're all scared and sad that they're alone and isolated. I feel like lucky in a way, like I'm so surrounded by people here. It's yeah, it's strange to be away from like where the epicenter is, you know, there's this helplessness, right? Like, what do I do? And in this case, people can really only stay home unless they're a doctor or medical worker and a grocer or essential worker. So like everyone, I'm like obsessively scrolling and reading the news and talking to people from Jersey. A lot of my board members um, are from New Jersey. A lot of my mentors and people I love and care about, my mom included. So it's weird. It's strange, right? Yeah. No, definitely. I, I feel that too. Um, I grew up in, in Europe and my entire family is is back in, in France and the UK and Germany. And it's, uh, yeah, it's difficult being a, apart from family during those times. So amidst all of this, and I know that you touched upon it a little bit already, uh, talking about the children earlier, but have you seen any positive outcomes? Positive outcomes... Yeah, the skies are so clear blue. Kathmandu as a city, which is our capital, quite far from here. But my colleagues who are from Kathmandu said that they can see the Himalayas for the first time. They can breathe clean air. The rivers are clearing up. You know, wildlife is coming back. We saw like a jungly cat um, come to our, our property up at the green school for the first time. So... I mean, that's the win in all of this, right? That the that the skies are clear, that Mother Earth and, and nature is happier. And, you know, that meme that we've all been seeing, like it feels like we're all getting sent to our rooms to think about what we've done. Like I've thought about that. I have to fly a lot back and forth. Like I'm always, you know, I have to take an airplane to get here. Both my husband and I, my husband's a cinematographer director. We, we travel for our jobs and felt like, wow, was all that travel really necessary? Like, so I think I'm hoping that the benefits continue, you know, like I've always said, oh, I want more time with the kids. I want more time with the kids. They're growing up so fast. Well, now I have that. We're cooking together. We're laughing together. We're reading more books together. So there are things to be grateful for. And there are lessons to learn that hopefully when this passes and all of the tragedy passes and, and we get through this, that we can bring some of the good and the learning and the lessons back. And yeah, we know mother nature needed a break from all of us human invasive species we ought, that we are. Yep. So I know you must have a lot of them. I think all of us do, but who would be one of your COVID-19 heroes? Who is someone that you're particularly grateful for who's helping out? Without a doubt, it's Saksha. My, um, oh, I just cried just thinking about it. You know, he he's one of the only drivers we have. So he just all day, 16 hours a day, takes the truck and picks up food from the mill from our farmer, who's a hero, our local farmers, 900 cooperative women. I mean, the food kits are 75 pounds. That's huge. Like, Carrying, he's carried thousands of kits and packed them along with the team. Um, but I was saying it's his birthday actually tomorrow. And I, I was thinking about him so much because it's his birthday. And I was like, he has been the center spoke of this wheel. I've always valued him. I've always loved him. I've always known he was one in a million, but like he hasn't stopped. He really hasn't stopped. Like he'll be up at the packing and loading zone till 10, 11 o'clock at night and then come back. He's also a co-parent here at the home and he'll drop off at the safe home. And he's just been working so hard. Like I'm getting teary just saying, just talking about it. And uh, he went up to a flood community day before yesterday and I didn't, i actually didn't go. I, I stayed home with the kids and he came back and he took a shower and washed up and he went straight to his room. And the next morning he came down and he said, you know, I'm just like, that was really hard. It was really depressing and I've, I've seen him tear up and I know that he has to take it in emotionally too, but he's my hero right now, without a doubt. <laughs> Definitely my hero. Well, on this note, Maggie, I can't thank you enough for being on this podcast and sharing about what you and everybody else who you live and work with is doing to support the community in Nepal. It's it's really quite beautiful and um and we're very grateful for you oh thank you lorraine i'm grateful for you and all of the heroes 
around the world. There's so many this is showing our good and humanity. So thanks for highlighting and, and sharing our story. I'd like to close off this episode by thanking Maggie and each and every person helping to run the Blink Now Foundation and its many programs and services. Intimately embedded in the Circuit community, it is remarkable to see the staff's strength and devotion. For me, this was one of the most moving interviews. If you'd like to support the Blink Now Foundation, please visit blinknow.org. You can donate money, shop handcrafted products made by Coppola Valley's Women's Co-op, and become a sponsor. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at COVID-19 underscore heroes and subscribe to it on all major podcast hosting platforms. Stay well, stay healthy. Thank you. And until next time, I'm your host, Lorraine Schneider.